Welcome again to all APUSH students. It is Monday. I hope your week has started out very well. Tonight is number seven in our seven-part series by the Bill of Rights Institute to focus on the extremely important content in preparation for the APUSH exam. Remember that you can view all the videos in this series on the Bill of Rights YouTube channel. Tonight, we're going to focus on developments in American foreign policy at the turn of the 20th century, focusing on imperialism, World War I, and the Versailles Treaty, as well as on cultural and economic developments of the 1920s. My name is Sean Redman. I am a high school U.S. history and civics teacher at Bolsa Grande High School in Garden Grove, California. Tonight, I have the great pleasure of representing an organization that I love called the Bill of Rights Institute. I will be monitoring the chat and gathering important questions to present to our content expert, Tom Ritchie. Throughout this series, I've tried to come up with some fun ways of saying something to complement Tom's expertise, but really it all comes down to this. Tom is flat out one of the best there is in AP preparation. I enjoy hearing his information every time. Tom Ritchie is a Louisiana native. Uh, he teaches uh, history and government classes in South Carolina. He's been teaching AP U.S. history since 2008. And since 2012, he has published AP U.S. history related content on his YouTube channel and website. Put your questions in the chat. I will give Tom as many as possible. Also, we have many of the links in the video notes for you to explore. So check them out, including Tom's Google Doc. I'll make sure that gets in there tonight so that you can look at all the information he's going to be showing and putting down there. Um, we do that because providing that informative material is an important mission of the Bill of Rights Institute. With that being said, let's welcome Tom. All right, Sean, as always, I mean, I just, uh, I need to bring you with me to my channel after all this is over. <laughs> um, this is just always great to get this, uh, this excellent introduction. And uh, the thing is, you can tell that it's officially exam week, okay? The exam's Thursday, you know, people are saying, oh, we've got over 100 people in here. And that's because this thing is coming up. So with that, um, you know, I want to let y'all know that the emphasis areas, of course, we've got an hour, um, but imperialism, World War I, 1920s, um, there's going to be some input from y'all as far as what y'all really want to emphasize. Now, remember that, uh, you know, Sean, uh, you know, he sounds like somebody that's a DJ or something like that, but he's also an A-push teacher. So he's going to be in the chat interacting, and he's also going to be, uh, you know, bringing some things to, you know, to my attention, like when he thinks that there's something that should come up, okay? So with that, ask your questions in the chat. Feel free to direct this. Like if Sean, uh, you know, sees in the chat that people are wanting something specific, then we're going to go in that direction, okay? But remember, when you see the Bill of Rights Institute answering questions in the chat, that is coming from an experienced AP U.S. history teacher as well. So with that, uh, you know, while Sean is out there in the chat, I'm going to go ahead and talk about American imperialism, okay? And so we want to get into some things here. And of course, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about, because foreign policy gets so complicated, you know, from president to president, uh, they, you know, will look at, uh, you know, they'll look at different uh, aspects, okay, because the perfect American foreign policy, it would project American power, and it would also do the right thing all the time, it would project American power, American interest, and American ideals, all at once. The thing is, though, in the real world, we can't really do that. And so, so the thing is, you know, every president kind of has their way of sort of making their mark here and, you know, become influential. Of course, this guy, Teddy Roosevelt, that I've got here. Now, of course, there's also this guy, George Washington, uh, you know, who uh, had a profound influence on our foreign policy. But we definitely see some things changing at the turn of the 20th century. And so, you know, I always like to think it's probably about time for me to update this map a little bit, but I'm sure it's still, uh, you know, it's still not too far off. In 2007, here are all of our troop deployments. I mean, U.S. troops on every inhabited continent. Uh, you know, this is something that we're all over the place. Now, the thing is, this wasn't always our foreign policy. And one of the things I like to, I like to note here, uh, the Washingtonian Jeffersonian foreign policy that a lot of people refer to as 
isolationism. Now, what I want to do here, I always put that in quotes, okay? Because the thing is, nobody ever says like, you know, hey, I'm Tom Ritchie and I'm an isolationist. You know, it, it's not something anybody would self-identify as. Washington called this neutrality. Jefferson called this neutrality. Now, remember that as Secretary of State from that POV, Jefferson didn't really appreciate the neutrality policy that Washington was putting out there. Jefferson actually resigned as Secretary of State because he didn't think Washington was listening to him. Um, that Washington, you know, when Jefferson's like, look, um, you know, sure, we don't want to send troops, but do we really have to proclaim our neutrality? And as president, Jefferson did stick to the policy of neutrality. And so with this, you know, Washington and his farewell address. Now, one of the things here that I always say here, and, uh, you know, Sean, feel free to chime in if you have some thoughts on this, is that I've always said that Washington's farewell address or neutrality proclamation is contextualization, it can be contextualization for almost any topic that has to do with foreign policy. So for example, a few years ago, I think 2018, the DBQ was about imperialism around the turn of the 20th century. Well, if I would have been writing that DBQ, I would have gone into Washington's farewell address and how we start to see at the turn of the century that shift. Okay. So, you know, as far as that goes, usually we take contextualization from the beginning of the period of the DBQ or the LEQ, or maybe from right before. But in this case, you know, Washington had such a profound influence that it becomes relevant, especially if it's any time before World War II. Um, Sean, do you have any thoughts to add there? You know, I, I was just thinking that uh, I agree completely. The contextualization is so important right here. And 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 going to Washington farewell address is definitely a winner. You can't lose there. OK, so, yeah, I think it's one of those like, you know, just, you know, one of those wild cards that you can play for just about any foreign policy. Remember that outside evidence has to be in the period, okay, of the DBQ or the LEQ. Contextualization does not have those limits. Now, contextualization has, has to be relevant. But one of the things is that Washington's farewell address and the principles that are in there, they stay relevant pretty much throughout our history, okay? And so you can even, you know, if you're if you're writing something about, you know, a domestic period where there was a lot of polarization and Washington's warnings about political parties, you know, Washington had a big uh, effect. Now, with this as well, one thing that I always like to point out as well is that when we say no entangling alliances, like that's a Jeffersonian term. You know, Washington, he said, we need to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. So the United States needs to remain a free agent when it comes to foreign policy. Now, Jefferson is the one that said peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. World War I, we tried that for a little bit. And then, you know, it's like the Germans and their U-boats and all of that kind of stuff. Then after World War I, we're just like, oh my goodness, what just happened there? We just got, you know, Europe were killing each other. And for a second, we convinced ourselves that it meant something. Okay. And then it ended up just like, you know, didn't, we'll talk about that later. Um, but with this, you know, I want to note here that, you know, when we talk about isolationism, that this is a pejorative term. Okay. So this is something, this is a term that's thrown at someone who is a fan of the Washingtonian, Jeffersonian, very limited foreign policy. Um, and so with that, you know, that's, uh, you know, they would call it neutrality, okay? And so with this, uh, you know, we see neutrality, avoid conflicts with other nations whenever possible. Now, the thing is that in the 20th century, there is a growing trend toward intervention, okay? Whereas, you know, we're engaging with other nations in order to promote the national interest of the United States. Now, we will get into uh, the Cold War and all of that on Wednesday night. Okay, we've got tonight. Remember those of you who are here tonight, tomorrow night, Wednesday night, okay, or evening at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. And then I'm going to be doing some stuff on my channel all three nights. So make sure you are uh, youtube.com slash Tom Ritchie, because I'm going to be nine o'clock tonight and then eight o'clock Tuesday and Wednesday. Okay, so I will be there for uh, for those broadcasts. And so with that, you know, 6.30 p.m., 
all three nights and then all three evenings on my channel at nine tonight, eight o'clock the next two nights. OK, so with that, um, we've got here, you know, one of the things when I, you know, the so-called unit nine, the post 1980, I never really get around to teaching that in my classroom, uh, you know, like a dedicated unit. But I do like to make, uh, you know, in, you know, just uh, inferences to it, you know, just to make references. And, you know, it's kind of like the other day I was comparing Thomas Jefferson and Ronald Reagan, you know, it was a great little exercise to kind of go like, okay, we're looking at the Jeffersonian period, but let's go ahead and look forward at this president who actually has a lot of comparisons to Jefferson. So George H.W. Bush, you know, he famously, when he got the Republican nomination, you know how Republicans feel about taxes. Uh, you know, Republicans weren't very excited about George H.W. Bush because he was more of like an establishment figure, had a history of more like moderate kind of Rockefeller fellow Republicanism. And, you know, so Bush, you know, to get the conservatives excited, he says, uh, you know, and you've got to think about this, the audience, you know, he is at the Republican National Convention and he says, read my lips, no new taxes. And of course it goes wild and he is, uh, you know, he hit his audience. They loved it. No new taxes at all. And that Republican audience just goes crazy over it. Now, the thing is, George H.W. Bush ended up signing a tax increase. So that's one of those things. Of course, that's something that, uh, you know, in history, it's like, okay, on one hand, he felt he needed to do it to try to balance the budget. On the other hand, um, it's something that certainly dampened Republican enthusiasm about his reelection, you know, during a recession and all of that. So the thing is that, uh, you know, his predecessor, Ronald Reagan said, you got to dance with the one that brung you. But this is one of the, probably the most famous, I would say it's in the top five Five broken campaign promises in U.S. history. Now, why am I talking about this? You know, that's, you know, I, I don't really think, that, I don't know if we'll see that or not. Maybe we will. But what I always compare this to is the Monroe Doctrine, where James Monroe and his Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, they say, read my lips. Now, James Monroe was from Virginia, so I can say that in my own accent. I don't have to do a New England accent. You know, read my lips no new colonies, okay? The Monroe Doctrine said, if Europe already has a colony, now we've got to keep in mind Cuba. At that time, Cuba was still a colony of Spain, but a lot of, you know, Mexico and other Latin American countries had gained their independence from Spain. And so basically Monroe is doing a few things here. First of all, he's expressing support for, you know, this is the same time the War of 1812 is just finished. We've got the era of good feelings. And, you know, these Latin American revolutions, it's like, you know what, we have an opportunity to be less, have less to do with Europe. This is the same time as Henry Clay's American system. National Bank, Internal Improvements, Protective Tariff, that, you know, Europe, we want some distance from you. Now, the Monroe Doctrine didn't end up, uh, you know, really impacting a lot of the time, but as a declaration of our foreign policy, that we are claiming essentially Latin America as a sphere of influence, you know, similar to how Joseph Stalin will do in Eastern Europe, you know, after World War II, that it is a claim on Latin America as a sphere of influence. And that's why Teddy Roosevelt is going to dust this off and say, hey, I got a corollary to this. More on that later. Okay, so the so Washington's farewell address and the Monroe Doctrine, these are two pillars of American foreign policy. And so, of course, you know, this was America back then at the time of the Monroe Doctrine. You know, we still had some manifest destiny to take care of. So with that, you know, the United States accomplishes manifest destiny. It's like, look, the other great countries in the world, you know, like look at the British, you know, they're a little bitty island and they got this big old empire. Why don't we have one of those? OK. And so with that, you know, we look at America now where, I mean, we have so many permanent alliances after World War II um, that the United States enters into NATO. Like all these countries in blue, if any of those countries gets attacked, we're going to war. OK, that's uh, you know, that's the thing. That's the reality. George Washington would just do a major uh, face palm there. Right. Um, so with that. 
how did the United States go from being an isolated nation to being a world power? And, and one of the answers is slowly. I think that this is when we think about continuity and change over time, this is something that's happening between 1898 and 1945, okay? This is something that is evolving. And of course, I think that the United States in the post-Cold War era, we're still trying to kind of get our footing. You know, it's like how much... It, do we want to really be involved? You know, do, is the United States, should the United States be a world leader or should the United States take advantage of its geography and kind of stay back from some of these things? Okay. And I think that's still a discussion that we're having. And so the Alaska purchase, which is one of those things that, you know, you could make, I mean, there would have been so many memes if this were in the days of social media. There would have been so many memes for the Alaska Purchase. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's really, you know, 1867. We see there is Andrew Johnson and his Secretary of State, William Seward, uh, you know, left over from Abraham Lincoln. And there is basically what we would call Seward's Folly or Seward's Icebox. Okay, so this is something, you know, Seward's Folly or Seward's Icebox box. And, you know, of course, uh, you know, Alaska, it's like, what did we do with that? Okay. And so with that, uh, you know, that we see 1898 is a big year. Okay. There are some years that you don't necessarily need to know, but then there are others that, uh, you know, are important. Okay. And so 1898, that's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty big year. And so another thing about, con you know, possible contextualization, is, um, you know, Mahan. Okay, so uh, we'll just remember Mahan. Okay, Alfred Thayer Mahan for anybody who's paying attention. But Mahan wrote a book called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. And as somebody who teaches uh, European history, um, this is something that's very interesting to me because he goes into like he's, he's mostly looking at modern European history and his thesis here. Okay, so his thesis statement is really something about, uh, you know, about about great nations have great navies, okay? Great nations must have great navies. Like there is not a great nation without a great navy. Think about Napoleon, for example, which do y'all know Wednesday is going to be the 200th anniversary of Napoleon's death. So that has nothing to do with AP US history, but it's still something cool to think about, right? And so with that, great nations must have great navies. Like it's just, you think about Napoleon, it's like, you know, he was able to do a lot, but at the end of the day, the British had a better Navy than he did, and he was not able to accomplish his goals. So the messaging here in 1890 is that if the United States wants to be a world power, we need to have a Navy that rivals the British. And if you look up active aircraft carriers, okay, like today, all right, so check this out, that evidently our government does not believe that this concept is obsolete. The United States has one aircraft carrier for every aircraft carrier in existence in the rest of the world. Like we could literally like have a naval battle with the rest of the world and probably win it. Isn't that awesome? America, you know, I mean, it's just I'm proud to be an American, huh? But with that, Great nations must have great navies. And so, you know, the U.S. Naval Academy even has a building named after him. So the thing is, this is where the United States gets started on its empire. You know, so we bought Alaska, also the Hawaiian Islands in 1898. So 1898, one of the things is we go in there and we go in Hawaii, we take over American economics. Now, when we think about the causes of American imperialism, one of those being economic control of some of these places. And one th another thing that, you know, I just kind of stumbled upon the other day is Alaska and Hawaii, they both attained statehood in 1959. And it was in 1960 that the UN released its declaration against colonialism and foreign rule and just like right there before the day you know it's one of those things right before that the united states like hey we probably we want to keep these things we're probably going to need to let them in as states now i've just I, I need to do a little more reading on that but the timing is very very interesting isn't it that these places that we got in the 1800s all of a sudden they both come in in 1959 right before the un condemns foreign rule 
And so with that, you know, the United States is definitely not proud of what we did in Hawaii, you know, overthrowing the queen and, uh, you know, all of that, you know, exploiting those islands, uh, you know, economically and whatnot. But at the same time, you know, Hawaii, why? Okay. Pearl Harbor, you know, which we know from the Pearl Harbor attack, December 7th, 1941, one of two dates that I tell students that uh, that they should know, July 4th, 1776, December 7th, 1941, okay? So a day that will live in infamy. Uh, and so Pearl Harbor, this is a refueling station for American ships. And so with that, um, this is something, uh, you know, something here, a refueling station. Basically, it's got this commanding position. We can have a naval base there and we can go refuel and then send the ships anywhere. And you can see where we get Midway, Guam, the, the Philippines will be in that a little bit. But notice this. 1898, 1899. Now, a few of these, 57, 58, 67, you know, a few of these, you know, you can see going back there. Now, one thing that we'll, uh, you know, we'll mention, social Darwinism, I'm just going to say it, it's one of the most oversimplified concepts that you're ever going to see on the exam. Um, but that comes up sometimes where social Darwinism is brought into the whole imperialism thing. Uh, now, one perspective on social Darwinism is this idea that, okay, the strong dominate the weak. In nature, the strong dominate the weak. Therefore, when a stronger nation runs across a less developed people, they should take them over because that's going to lead to overall human progress. Now, we'll get to another perspective on social Darwinism in a little bit, okay? So Cuban independence in the 1890s, Cuba is fighting for its independence from Spain. And so with that, uh, a couple of amendments that you want to know. Um, first of all, the Teller Amendment. Now, um, 1898, again, we put out the Teller Amendment. Go to Cuba and tell her we don't want her. That's, that's how I remember. That's how I remember. Go to Cuba and tell her we don't want her. Now, at least we don't want to annex it, okay? We just want to control Cuba. We don't want to actually formally annex it and take on that responsibility, okay? Um, but we just want to get it into our sphere of influence. And so with that, uh, you know, now don't forget that, okay? That Sean can tell you that is a very important ship right there, okay? Do not forget that. That is the USS Maine. Uh, make sure you remember the Maine, okay? And, and I think really there's, there's no other single ship that is more important for this exam because this literally, uh, you know, started a, uh, you know, started a war. And so, you know, with that, uh, you know, with that, we're seeing that it's entering Havana Harbor and we see, uh, you know, we see it going in there. And so that uh, my students wanted like a sound that wasn't a ship blowing up, but like a wildcat or something like that, a mountain lion. I forget what it was, but that goes back like, uh, you know, million, not millions of years, but like about a decade ago, I think my students said they wanted that. But basically, that's the explosion. Now, the explosion happened. That is a historical fact. OK, the explosion of the main happened. That is a historical fact. And so with that, why did it happen? And today, journalists, they will, uh, you know, journalists and authors, they want to win the Pulitzer Prize. Now, philanthropy, OK, rich guys. They make a lot of money, they feel low key guilty about it. And they're like, I gotta do something for society, okay? You know, like the Nobel Prize, what this guy like invented dynamite or something like that. And so then the Pulitzer Prize, like if this prize is being given out to journalists, like as a philanthropy venture, you have to ask like, what did this guy do wrong in order to like, you know, make this prize? Um, because, you know, I mean, you can pretty much tell yourself that, you see? So the Pulitzer Prize is out there. What did he do wrong? And so the thing is that, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, Joseph Pulitzer is one of the creators of what we call yellow journalism, okay? And so when we look at the cause of the Spanish-American War. What we see here is the, I mean, I would say that yellow journalism was the original fake news, okay? Like this is the original, like the media is giving up any kind of, uh, you know, obligation to report the news to the public in a responsible way, okay? So Joseph Pulitzer with the New York World, William Randolph Hearst at the New York Journal, they are competing with each other for circulation and circulation 
circulation, just like the circulation for the of the blood keeps me alive. Thank you, William Harvey, um, for letting me know that. Of course, that's Euro. But uh, but with that, I got two exams to prepare for this week. Uh, you know, so with that, uh, you know, we've got these sensational headlines because both of these papers are competing with each other. So basically, you know, they're like, okay, and you can see some of the tricks that like media companies, I think today, like, you know, cable news of all stripes, you know, they use these same kind of tactics. You know, it's like main explosion caused by bomb or torpedo. Now, no, dear, we didn't say it was. We're just asking questions, okay? And the thing is, there are some people that are in doubt. We're just reporting that people have doubts. We're not saying we doubt. I mean, come on now. And so with this, oh, the, the accident was made possible by an enemy. Now, this is one of those things, if we brought this to a court of law or something like that, okay? If we brought this to a court of law, like we would not be able to, I mean, this would be thrown out. This would not even go in front of a grand jury. Like they wouldn't be able to charge anybody with this. I mean, it certainly wouldn't go to trial. And so the thing is, is though that the media they don't have to go to trial they just have to print stuff and people are buying this stuff you know notice and i love here like how they're using font sizes and stuff okay because here's the thing you can only be held responsible for the words that you print okay so you can only be responsible for the words that you print and so the thing is here that when we're thinking about this that this is something that crisis is at hand you know you think about the orphans the little newsboys you know they're yelling extra extra read all about it crisis is at hand cabinet in session growing belief in spanish treachery so here's the thing that it's basically like okay crisis is at hand you know call it a crisis stir it up okay and then cabinet in session growing belief in Spanish treachery. So you see here, extra, extra, uh, you know, Maine destroyed by an outside attack. Naval officers believe. I tell you, can y'all see? I'm like amused by yellow journalism. Like, I, I mean, it's unfortunate that it happened, but it's really, really like the president is suspicious of Spanish plots. And so, and this is my favorite, okay? Like, I mean, so here, it, I mean, these people are basically like starting a war. So it's like, it's kind of serious, but come on. Um, you know, $50,000 reward. Now, you know, your teachers are more likely to have seen Austin Powers than you have, but it's like, you know, you think about Dr. Evil, you know, we're talking about like pre-federal reserve dollars here, uh, you know, $50,000 reward like today, one million dollars okay like the thing is when he's offering a fifty thousand dollar reward for the detection of the perpetrator of the main outrage now he is offering by our standards today one million dollars and so the thing is that this is one of those things he knows nobody's going to know like he puts this reward out there and I, I'm pretty sure these people know, like they're just stirring up drama and they, you know, they have a, um, you know, they're just, they're, they're coming up with a, with a hoax here. And so with this, you know, like you think about it, like, you know, you think about it at school, like you've got your friend, like, you know, your schoolmate or whatever that always likes to stir up drama. If you're thinking about this person, uh, you know, this is basically yellow journalism, you know, how do we make drama? And this is, you know, Joseph Pulitzer, William Randolph Hearst. And so, you know, it's like, hey, I'm just doing my patriotic duty. And we've got a little drawing here of how it could have happened, okay? This is basically like, here's how the Spanish could have put a mine there. Again, court of law, somebody would be asking about motive, okay? They'd be like, what's the motive here? Um, but the thing is, motive doesn't matter with the public. I mean, this is the manipulation of the public, getting the public to demand a war that the government doesn't really want to get into which today we have the opposite problem. You know, it's like the government wants to go to war. And, you know, it's like, I mean, you know, you don't see, I mean, when, you know, every once in a while, like somebody bombs Syria, you know, it's not like the American people are like, our government needs to bomb Syria. You know, it's just like we get the paper and it's like, okay, our, our government dropped bombs on Syria. Why did that happen? But here, this is the opposite. Like the people are demanding a war. And so the thing is, the jingle goes, remember the main to hell with Spain, okay? And so there's just all of this like anti 
Spanish sentiment drawn up here. Uh, TJ went from an artist. Now he's a, you know, state, uh, you know, state uh, trooper now. But, uh, you know, first he was just an artist uh, here in high school. And uh, gosh, that was so long. But basically, you don't really need to know anything about the Spanish-American War. You know, Teddy Roosevelt went over there, um, charge of the Rough Riders, and, you know, they called it a splendid little war. And so the Rough Riders, they're like, okay, we won this battle. Let's take a picture. And they write songs about it. And you notice here in this legend here, um, Spanish territories, U.S. forces, Spanish forces, U.S. victories. There's nothing for Spanish victories, okay? So that's pretty much it. Like the United States shows up and then it's like Spanish fleet destroyed, bam, okay? And so with that, you know, it's just, it's this very one-sided war. And then at the end of the war, the United States pays $20 million to Spain in return for a free Cuba, air quotes, okay? Yeah, Cuba's free, all right. And then the United States gets Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. Now, Puerto Rico and Guam are still part of the United States of America today. Um, and then the Philippines. And so with that, uh, you know, 1898, we see here, I mean, the United States has come a long way from 1798. Now, after that, the other amendment, remember the Teller Amendment, go to Cuba, and tell her we don't want her. So the Platt Amendment in 1901, we basically said, Cuba, you're independent, but you're going to be our little buddy, okay? Our little our little brother or our, our child or something like that. You're going to be a protectorate. Like a protectorate is a country that's independent, but some of its decision-making is subject to an outside power. The Romans did this a lot, uh, but no treaties without U.S. approval, no excessive public debt. Who are we to talk these days? Um, the U.S. can intervene in cases of civil unrest. I think this happened three times that the United States sent troops into Cuba in order to restore order. And finally, a perpetual naval lease at Guantanamo Bay, which perpetual means forever. We have never given that up. Castro's government, like the communists, they tried to cut the water. We put up a, a desalinization plant, like the base at the naval base at Guantanamo Bay. Um, basically, uh, you know, we've got uh, machines like big machines that take the, uh, you know, take the salt out of the water and all of that. And so with that, um, you know, that's what we've got here. And so one thing we want to note, uh, you know, so with that, um, with that, you know, a legacy of resentment, okay? And so with this, when we're looking at a legacy of resentment that the, the Latin Americans, and especially in Cuba, like one of the things about the Cuban revolution that we need to appreciate here um, is that, you know, this is one of the things that'll lead to the Cuban revolution. Um, because, you know, the Cuban people did not choose communism. The Cuban people chose somebody who was saying that, you know, I I'm going to overthrow a dictator and I'm going to give you freedom and democracy and also, uh, you know, independence from United States, from American meddling, you see. And so that's something there that is very important to note here, that one of the things about Cuba is that there was this resentment toward the United States, uh, you know, about the constant meddling in their affairs. And then, you know, Cuba is, uh, you know, still a communist controlled country today. And so with that, you know, we've got a few other things, you know, we don't actually set up an empire in China, but there were countries that had their spheres of influence. And we basically announced the open door policy, okay? The open door policy, which says that the United States is gonna disregard existing European spheres of influence in China. And we'll just come in there and we'll do uh, whatever, we, you know, we'll just go anywhere and do whatever we want. Now, one thing to note here is that uh, the Philippines, okay? there is an especially like, you know, an especially horrific uh, war in the Philippines. And this is where we have to ask. Remember, I said that the ideal American foreign policy, uh, you know, the, the ideal American foreign policy um, is a foreign policy that can project American power, it can project American influence, and it can project American ideals. And when we think about what happened in the Philippines, you know, we get the Philippines and the Filipinos had been fighting for their independence. And you ask yourself, what would be the American thing to do here? And when we ask ourselves and really ask ourselves, what would be the American thing to do? 
it would be to grant them their independence. You know, they've been fighting for this. But of course, there is this, uh, you know, this, you know, scientific racism that was around at that time. And it's like, no, these people, they're not ready for independence, you know, coming up with all of these excuses. And so with that, we see an American firing squad shooting these Filipino kids, uh, you know, and, and this kind of stuff was happening. OK, I mean, there were definitely some some atrocities happening there. And now, of course, the United States, we like to say, like, hey, the United States and the Philippines, Hawaii, look at how bad everything was and look at them now. OK, the United States that now we've taken off the oppression from these people. Look at them now. They're all rich. Come on now. All right. So with that, you know, basically um, this was a lot of this was about expanding American markets um, and making sure that there were markets for American produce, American goods. Um, we're taking raw materials from these places. We're setting up naval bases. And so with this, though, what about the Constitution and the insular cases, which have really never been like over overturned? I mean, this is actually, I think, still a basis in American law that when we look at the 14th Amendment that says if you're born in the United States, then you are a citizen. Uh, the Supreme Court said that when it comes to overseas territories, that's up to Congress, whether they have citizenship and constitutional rights. And so from there, you know, thinking about uh, this, the Anti-Imperialist League. League. And this is Mark Twain, Andrew Carnegie, and then William Graham Sumner. Now, Sumner, um, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, Sean can attest to this. Sumner likes to come up on, uh, you know, on DBQs, okay? William Graham Sumner was a Yale professor and one of the best known public intellectuals of his day. And, uh, you know, one thing, like when I was on Google last year, remember we had those joke exams last year? Um, and I was like, I wonder what the DBQ is about. So I got on Google Trends and I did a little search for like a push and I was like last in the last hour. And I noticed in the last hour when people were searching for a push, they were searching for William Graham Sumner, what social classes owe to each other. Now, I'm not using any information I got from the college board or anything like that. I have no inside information, but I was like, oh my goodness, that is just classic, that William Graham Sumner is on there again. There have been multiple times I've seen this guy on a DBQ, and William Graham Sumner is one of these people that's in the anti-imperialist league, and that's the other side of social Darwinism. He was actually like one one of the foremost like social Darwinist, which is like just a vague term that's applied to some random people. Um, but Sumner, he believed that imperialism was wrong. Like it was a betrayal of American values of independence. Because remember that one of the things about social Darwinism is competition and the strong dominating the weak. But the other part of social Darwinism is non-interference. You know, if any of y'all are into Star Trek, I am. If you're not, that's cool. But there is the general order number one or the prime directive that if a planet does not have warp technology, they don't even get into it, okay? And so with that, you know, if we Americans believe in self-government, why do we let it slip away from us? Why do we barter it away for military glory as Spain did? Notice here his ironic title, The Conquest of the United States by Spain. We won the Spanish-American War, but what did we get out of that? I mean, we're basically becoming Spain. We gained the whole world and lost our soul, so to speak, uh, you know, if you want to uh, throw a Jesus quote in there. Um, and so, uh, you know, so if you take away the Constitution, what is American liberty and all the rest? Nothing but a lot of phrases. And so that's something to just think about, you know, how American is imperialism, you know, and really how much does the United States want to, uh, you know, intervene in these, uh, you know, in these places. So with that, you know, I'm going to go from there and, uh, you know, I'm going to run over to the Versailles Treaty. Where they, well, I'll, I go into World War I real quick in the Versailles Treaty. Um, now, imperialism is just always a great thing to, uh, you know, just to get into because it's really setting the stage for all of this. Um, Sean, is there anything coming in from the, uh, from the chat that uh, would be good to bring to my attention? Yeah, I think just a couple of quick things and you'll be able to move on. So one is uh, subject related. Another one's kind of a business. Uh, so subject related, somebody's wondering about any need to uh, brush up on dollar diplomacy for the test. 
Um, and then, and then the uh, other one is just, Hey, thinking about the DBQs, um, for all three test dates, will they likely be from different units or the same unit? Yeah. So, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, yeah, I think that the DBQs now, one thing that we want to note here is that, uh, the DBQs, there will be different DBQs in each administration. Okay. So, so basically on Thursday, there will likely be three, at least three different DBQs. Okay. So we're going to see different DBQs given to different people on the same day. Um, I would think that they're not going to necessarily come from the same, uh, the same time period. Um, so with that, uh, you know, so with that, I don't think that there's going to be a commonality there. Um, so that's going to be, uh, you know, so I think they're going to be different things. But, you know, one thing I've noted, I strongly doubt the DBQ, um, you know, for Thursday's exam, the paper pencil, I strongly doubt they're going to be using like doing this on like post World War Two topics, because people are going to say, well, that wasn't fair. But yeah, the thing is, remember, DBQ is process oriented anyway. Now, as far as that goes, yeah, Teddy Roosevelt's big stick, okay, Teddy Roosevelt's big stick foreign policy, it is a very muscular foreign policy, you know, we're gonna, you know, Teddy Roosevelt said, speak softly and carry a big stick, you know? So basically we're gonna get out there, we're gonna swing the big stick, we're gonna get into Latin America with the Roosevelt corollary and say, hey, the Monroe Doctrine said no new colonies. So therefore a corollary, a logical extension of that is we don't want Europeans collecting money from directly, okay, from these colonies. And because something that, that I think is important, like it's kind of analogy I use that if Sean and I are in the classroom and there's a student that's like, you know, like, you know, on their phone and I'm like, put your phone down, put your phone down. And then finally, I'm like, okay, look, give me your keys. All right. And so I take the student's keys and I tell the student, come get these keys from me in two weeks because you didn't listen to me. You're not going to have your car. Now, I'm probably going to get a call from that student's parent who's going to be like, why did you take my kid's keys? And I'll be like, well, he wasn't, eh, why did you take my kid's keys? And so with that, you know, when I think about the Roosevelt corollary, Teddy Roosevelt said, look, if Venezuela or any other country is not paying their debts to you, bring it to me. I'll deal with my kid. OK, and so that's the Roosevelt corollary that he says that, you know, we don't want political domination of Latin America. But as a corollary, we also don't want European economic domination of Latin America. We don't want Europeans sending gunboats to Latin America. That's our job. OK, which uh, that's another one. You know, Sean's probably seen Animal House and, you know, where it's like they can't do that to our pledges. Only we can do that to our pledges, you know, and that is the Roosevelt corollary and the big stick. Send the great white fleet around the world because we can, okay? Um, you know, and then the Panama Canal, like, you know what? They don't want to let us build a canal in, in Colombia, doesn't want to let us build a, you know, canal across the isthmus. Oh, there are some rebels in Panama, some secessionists, you say. You know what? Let's go ahead and recognize them as an independent country, right? Uh, so, so it's just it's so interesting just the level of you know hypocrisy you can see from some of the decisions that are made at this time. But the big stick is a very muscular and nationalistic foreign policy. Okay, that it is about like America going out there and like look at this, you know. And then dollar diplomacy. It William Howard Taft. It's about protecting American investments. Now, I typically don't really go into it any further than that. You can find some supporting evidence, you know, going into like, you know, basically these fruit companies and such are going in there and, you know, just protecting American investments. Then Woodrow Wilson, Woodrow Wilson with what I call the M&M diplomacy, moral diplomacy or missionary diplomacy. And I like to call it M&M &M because I'm just really like people who know me know that I'm something of a foreign policy realist. And so when I think about Wilson, it's like M&M, &M. like basically Wilson to me, it's like candy foreign policy. Like, you know, just, uh, you know, it's just like, you know, eat some chocolate and it's really sweet and good, but uh, it's not necessarily good for you. Okay. But, uh, but Woodrow Wilson, it's more of like, hey, we're going to do, we're going to promote democracy. We're always going to do the right thing. And it's one of those things that Roosevelt is more like, 
America, okay, nationalist, um, whereas Woodrow Wilson is more internationalist, okay, so when you look at presidents that have, have had a more internationalist kind of view of foreign policy, they go back to Wilson, okay, so if we think like, you know, Jimmy Carter would be another example of a, uh, you know, of a somebody who believed that foreign policy should be based on morality. Now, Jimmy Carter did have, uh, you know, one feather in his cap, uh, you know, that under Jimmy Carter, Egypt uh, became the first, uh, you know, Muslim majority country to recognize Israel. Okay, so that's something the Camp David Accords, uh, they won, uh, you know, there were Nobel Peace Prizes all around. That was like a really big deal. Uh, you know, some countries still don't recognize Israel today. But, you know, when Carter became president, there was no, uh, you know, Arab country that recognized Israel. And so with that, you know, Jimmy Carter actually did have some things, uh, you know, some things there. Um, but, uh, but then, uh, you know, there was the Iran hostage crisis. And that was something that, you know, was kind of a debacle for Jimmy Carter. And Ronald Reagan was able to take that. Um, and, um, you know, as far as that goes, that Ronald Reagan was able to take that and, cast Jimmy Carter as somebody that was weak on foreign policy. Thank y'all for those of you that are hitting the like button. Uh, you know, be sure to do, you know, if you appreciate this review, um, give the Bill of Rights Institute a like. And also uh, remember, I'm going to go ahead and post my link here because I'm going to be doing reviews. Um, you know, I want to make sure... Let me go in here because I want to make sure that you know how to uh, how to get to my reviews. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and send this link to you so that you can join me later. And like I said, I'm with the Bill of Rights Institute uh, to this evening on um, tomorrow, Wednesday, all at 630. Um, but I'm going to be at 9 p.m. tonight and then 8 p.m. the next two nights. Uh, you know, you can go ahead and put that in there. You'll have to paste the link, um, but that's going or you can subscribe to my channel. It'll be on there as well. But this will get you right in there to ask questions. And so as far as that goes, um, this is going, this is 6.30 to 7.30, but remember I'm going to be on Crowdcast, uh, that link that I just shared with y'all in the chat. I'm going to be there, um, you know, in, uh, you know, I'm going to be there later. All right. We got a lot of likes there. Excellent. Thank y'all for that. Um, and so coming from there, that Woodrow Wilson is more of an internationalist. Now, of course, before World War I, Woodrow Wilson, or when World War I first starts, just just like with World War II, Americans wanted to stay out of it. Now, one thing we have to note here, while all this stuff's going on in Europe, sometimes there were divided loyalties, you know, that basically native-born Americans, Greek and Russian immigrants tended to favor the allies, whereas German and Austrian immigrants, of which we have many, you know, German um, immigrants are, you know, they are very prevalent in the Midwest, for example. And so, you know, there were some, pe some people in the United States that, you know, favored the central powers, but Americans as a whole wanted to keep out of there. And of course, again, contextualization, George Washington. Now, when I'm thinking about the provocations, I like to think about uh, Dora the Explorer, okay? I used to watch Dora the Explorer, um, like no lie as an adult, okay? I love that show. I mean, I'd still watch it today if it, if it was on, you know? I'd, I'd be pointing, you know? It's like, oh, there, there it is over there. Like, come on, Dora, you don't see it? Um, and so when I look at that, you know, those who used to watch Dora, I like to go in the provocations of World War One. that like you think about the map. Okay, so cruise ship, telegram, let's see, cruise ship, telegram, submarine, say it with me, cruise ship, telegram, submarine, one more time, cruise ship, telegram, submarine, where are we going? World War One. Okay, so with that, I mean, this is just, it just gets me in the vibe. I love Dora. Okay, and so I uh, don't, de vamos. World War One. Okay, so with that, those are the provocations. And what we want to note here is that World War One is the first time the United States ever gets involved in a European war. Okay, so, you know, over there over there. You know, I mean, basically, you know, we're going over there. Now, of course, not yet, though, because at first, you know, the cruise ship is the Lusitania. Now, the thing is about the Lusitania, I, I just, I frankly, like, it's like the Germans tried to warn people, like, don't get on this ship, you know, that, you know, we're at war right now. 
don't get on this ship, okay? So when the Lusitania was attacked, even though it was an outrage, this is in 1915. Now remember that the Lusitania was a British ship. So the Germans did not fire upon an American ship, but 128 Americans died. Now, Teddy Roosevelt uh, was still around and he was like, let's go, let's go to war. You know, basically Teddy Roosevelt, it's like, he wants to get off a big stick. They just attacked America. We're going to show them. But Woodrow Wilson's like, you know, let's stay out of here for right now. And so with that, though, that then there is, uh, you know, in 1916, Wilson's campaign slogan, he kept us out of war. Now, notice the operative word there, kept, okay? Doesn't mean we can't get in there. FDR also said in 1940 that your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. Now, if we get attacked, it's no longer a foreign war, right? Now, Mexico still had some, uh, you know, some, uh, oh, oops, what? What happened? Okay, I don't know why my smoke alarm's going off. There is no reason for that. Let me uh, Oh my goodness. Um, Sean, I'm going to try to mute myself here. I don't know what happened. I swear there's not a fire here. Okay, so uh, let's see. Okay. All right, I think I should be good. All right, so with that, I don't know what just happened. Whoo, that woke me up. I'm sorry what that did to your, uh, to any of you listening on headphones, okay? But uh, basically, you know, Mexico still had some legitimate gripes here about, uh, you know, what happened here. We're not trying to promote, uh, you know, alcohol here or anything like that, just to make that clear. It was just an advertisement that caused some outrage uh, about 15 years ago, like when it was put out in Mexico and Americans got kind of upset because the, uh, you know, the subtext is that we stole that land uh, from Mexico. Um, and so with that, you know, basically the Germans told the Mexicans, hey, could you uh, maybe, uh, you know, attack the United States and we will give you Texas, New Mexico and Arizona. And so with that, uh, you know, that uh, the, the Mexicans are like, no, we're not going to do that. OK, but at the same time, the British intercepted. Now, I don't know. Well, I'll tell you what, that's uh, that's a great content uh, comment we have there, uh, Eli. <laughs> Only fire thing around here is this great ape push review. <laughs> I know Tom's going to appreciate that. So uh, anyway, as he's getting that done, uh, I did put uh, his because uh, uh, I, I know he thought he put it on there, but I put his uh, website and YouTube channel in the chat so you can check that stuff out there. Um, and I all right. And Sean, I think uh, I've got now the air conditioner running with the doors open. I know it's not the best thing for my carbon footprint, but it should keep us going for a little bit longer. Now, also, uh, ladies and gentlemen, one thing, uh, you know, I would say that you want to follow BRI students um, on Instagram. Um, that would be a great thing for you there. BRI students, you can see, uh, you know, you can see with me, I'm following BRI students. Um, and also, you can reach me at Tom Ritchie. Um, T-O-M-R-I-C-H-E-Y, but uh, make sure to stay in touch with uh, BRI students because it's a great account to follow um, for some things that, uh, you know, just to stay uh, to stay up uh, up to speed. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, BRI students, Tom Ritchie um, on Instagram, just to stay in touch for things that are going on that could be helpful to y'all. So with that, I might do a few Instagram shout outs on the way out of here, but uh, but with that, the British intercepted the telegram, even though, uh, you know, the, the Mexicans said, we're not going to we're not going to do that. We're not going to attack. And there we go. But what happened here is also so we see about the submarine, the Germans said we are now going to resume unrestricted submarine warfare. OK, so this is something this could be at least partially analogous to the War of 1812, that it's like the United States feels like its neutral rights are under attack. So at that point, we end up getting in there and Wilson, you know, he's got a direct cause that the German policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. But then he gets out his M&Ms and, uh, you know, he says, look, while we're at it, we're going to make the world safe for democracy. Now, the thing is, tomorrow we'll talk about World War II and how a lot of Americans, you know, they felt like we can, we've been kind of duped, you know, we got into World War I, we were going to make the world safe for democracy, and all of a sudden, like, you know, all of these, uh, you know, totalitarian regimes show up and Europeans are killing each other all over again. So with that, you know, we also want to note 
what's going on during the Treaty of Versailles, okay? And this is something that we're going to kind of wrap up. Now, I will let you know, I'm going to, I'm going to let you know that on my YouTube channel, I have a video. Will, if you, if you look up Woodrow Wilson Versailles Treaty, you're going to see the uh, video there. And thank you, uh, Hannah and Casey and Jack and Madeline and Gloria um, for the recent Instagram follows. And I hope that you are also following BRI students. Okay, great content there. And so with that, you know, Wilson's the first sitting American president to go to Europe with the 14 points. And so he goes to the, four, you know, goes to Europe. Now these are, you know, not necessarily, you know, like must know, but it's good to kind of know the spirit of the 14 points is that Wilson, you know, he's looking at the causes of World War I and he's like, here are, the, here are the things we can do so we don't fight World War I again. Now, the thing is, you look at reduction of arms, that's one of the biggest, uh, you know, factors in, uh, you know, in bringing about World War II, you know, also taking a bit of land from Germany and all that. But the biggest thing here is Wilson's advocacy of the League of Nations, okay? Wilson believes an international organization must be founded so we can talk about all of our problems, you know, basically like a group therapy session for nations so that we don't get into this kind of war again. And Wilson was big on this idea of a peace without victory. Now, as far as that goes, there are a lot of things wrong with the Versailles Treaty, but then it gets to the U.S. Senate, okay? And so with this, the U.S. Senate has a lot of power when it comes to treaties, which is why, you know, when Sean is teaching AP government, you know, we also talk about executive agreements that we don't really make a lot of treaties anymore because you need two thirds of the Senate to concur with a treaty, like the president has to have the concurrence of two thirds of the Senate. And so that's what you need to get a treaty ratified. Now, when Wilson went to Europe, he brought zero senators with him, which, uh, you know, just kind of is beyond me. I would, I would want to include the Senate if they were going to make the decision, especially if the Senate's controlled by the other party. And so with that, the Republicans took the Senate in 1918. And so with that, the League of Nations is something that gets to be controversial because there are some provisions in it. And again, if you want something more in-depth, um, take a look at my lecture on my YouTube channel, you know, Tom Ritchie, Woodrow Wilson Senate. Um, and so this, that basically we could get pulled into another war without the consent of Congress. And so the thing is, you've got really three uh, different factions in the U.S. Senate. The internationalists, who are Wilson's people, mostly Democrats, um, who want to ratify the Treaty of Versailles as is. You've got the irreconcilables who say, don't ratify this treaty at all. It's garbage, okay? And then the reservationists who would say, let's ratify the treaty with reservations. Ratify the treaty, but with an asterisk, making sure that we can't be drawn into a war. And the reservationists and the irreconcilables, they want to protect American sovereignty. And so with that, now Henry Cabot Lodge, he's kind of trolling Wilson here. Um, he has basically 14 reservations that he proposes here that will adopt the Treaty of Versailles with 14 reservations. Now, at the end of the day, long story short, Wilson refuses to compromise with the reservationists. The reservationists, um, you know, if Wilson would have told his people ratify the treaty with reservations that will join the League of Nations with an asterisk, it could have happened. But Wilson insisted on not compromising at all. And as a result, the United States did not join the League of Nations. And all Woodrow Wilson gets is a Nobel Peace Prize. Now, we were slated to do a little bit about the 20s, uh, you know, with this. But uh, I've also got a video on 1920s foreign policy. So two uh, kind of homework things I would recommend are 1920s foreign policy and Wilson versus the Senate. These are two videos I've got on my YouTube channel. And then tomorrow we will be back here at 6.30 to go into the Great Depression and World War II. Now I'm also going to be on my channel tonight at nine and then tomorrow and Wednesday at eight. So just remember that those things are happening. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we will, um, you know, we will be uh, in touch and here's Sean to close us out. All right, all right. Uh, well, well, thank you so much for joining with Tom Ritchie and the Bill of Rights Institute and me this evening. Uh, the Bill of Rights Institute website is a place where you can find, as Tom said before, so many great primary sources, 
excellent lessons, uh, essays, live participation opportunities for students and teachers, and essay contents and videos, all aimed at making U.S. history and government comprehensible and fun. Uh, go ahead and check that out. Also follow on Instagram, BRI Students. I put the link into the chat so you can check that out there and get right over there. Uh, join us again tomorrow evening uh, when we continue for the final two segments. The topic will be the Great Depression and World War II. Uh, also check out the links I put in the uh, show notes there for uh, uh, TomRitchie.net and his YouTube channel so you can get information about uh, getting more reviews with him uh, tonight, next couple of nights. So on behalf of the Bill of Rights Institute and Tom Ritchie, have a nice evening and happy studies. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Always a pleasure.